It's my privilege to be invited to speak at the Bahania International Forum on One Country, Two Systems, Achievements and Prospects. I wish the International Forum every success. The handover of Hong Kong in 1997 to China was a hugely significant event. It reversed the loss of Hong Kong following the first opium war, one of the most disgraceful episodes in British colonial history. And it was to mark also the beginning of the century of humiliation. The handover in contrast was a landmark moment in China's quest to reunify the country and recover its lost territories. China's approach was, in global terms, highly innovative. The idea of one country, two systems was fundamentally alien to the Western nation state tradition. In contrast, it was deeply rooted in Chinese thinking, based on the notion of China as primarily a civilization state rather than a nation state. While the Western tradition assumes one country, one system, the Chinese tradition draws on the idea of one country, many systems. Innovative, appropriate, and timely, as the idea of one country, two systems undoubtedly was, China faced a very complex problem in Hong Kong. What should be the precise balance between one country on the one hand and two systems on the other? In this context, it faced two challenges, one external and the other internal. The attitude of the West and domestic Hong Kong opinion, respectively. The West consistently downplayed one country, that is Chinese sovereignty, and placed overwhelming emphasis on two systems. Hong Kong attitudes for their part were to a degree supportive, but also skeptical. After the handover, Hong Kong chose to move slowly, emphasizing continuity rather than rupture, anxious to reassure both Western opinion and local Hong Kong doubts. By 2014, however, it was clear that there was growing dissatisfaction in Hong Kong, culminating in the riots of 2019. If the central priority in Hong Kong in 2020-21 in was to restore order and stability, the main task now confronting the government is winning the support of the Hong Kong people. The primary reason for the disillusionment was socio-economic, rocketing pro property prices, a chronic shortage of homes, and an old colonial style oligopolistic economy, which generated huge inequality and little innovation. Between 1997 and 2019, the government had failed to tackle these fundamental problems. No serious break was made with the legacy of the colonial era. On the contrary, in key respects, little changed. The status quo largely prevailed. This was further exacerbated by the legacy of Hong Kong's colonial history. After 156 years of British colonialism, Hong Kongers habitually looked west, not north. Many liked the idea of being Western at a time when the West still enjoyed considerable status and prestige. That is why many had mixed feelings about the handover, to which they responded with, shall we say, passive acceptance. There is no simple solution to the latter. History is history. 156 years is a very long time. 
any meaningful solution to this problem will require the passage of time, the creation of a newly successful Hong Kong that people can identify with and take ownership of, combined with patient, persuasive statecraft on the part of the Hong Kong government and the Chinese government. The socio-economic problem, though, is a different matter. This demands urgent attention and a major shift in strategy and thinking by the Hong Kong authorities. One country, two systems, Mark II, as I would describe it, should comprise three key features. First, a new unity based on an unambiguous acceptance of Chinese sovereignty. This is not new. It was, a funda it was fundamental to one country, two systems, Mark I. But it was constantly challenged and accept and contested both within Hong Kong and by Western politicians and media. There can be no further ambiguity. Second, Hong Kong's future depends on a much closer relationship with China in a whole host of different ways, including, most importantly of all, the Greater Bay Area. The Northern Metropolis project near the border with Shenzhen is a most welcome development in this context. The center of gravity of Hong Kong needs to shift northwards. Third, an ambitious and radical program of socio-economic reform that can transform Hong Kong in a manner similar to China's own, own reform program. The central thrust for Hong Kong must be what I would describe as the modernization and decolonization of Hong Kong in terms of its economic structure and its administrative system. The control ex exercised by a handful of tycoons over the supply of land must be ended. A huge program of residential construction is a prerequisite. Together, these offer the prospect of cheaper housing and a plentiful supply of homes, the lack of which is perhaps the biggest grievance of ordinary Hong Kongers. If China can abolish extreme poverty, Hong Kong can and should be expected to do no less. The anger and alienation revealed by the riots came overwhelmingly from the young, who felt Hong Kong offered them little in the way of hope in terms of jobs, education, and housing. Winning the young is the most important task facing the government. It is encouraging that John Lee, the new chief executive, has embraced many of the above points in his initial statements. The problem with one country, two systems, Mark I, was its failure to address the legacy of British colonial, colonialism and its acquiescence in a status quo that was clearly failing the majority of the people. Mark II must be very different. A radical program of reform in housing, land supply, education and training, combined with an assault on poverty and inequality can together stimulate a new sense of optimism in Hong Kong and begin the process of winning the hearts and minds of the people. Thank you for listening.